Hi, this is Ivan of Wild Latitudes Birding and Nature Tours. Today I'm going to meet up with a fellow Oregonian named Noah Stricker. Noah has a book that came out recently called Birding Without Borders. It's a really good book and what it talks about, what Noah writes about, is his grand adventure in 2015 where he traveled around the world to 41 countries trying to see 5,000 species of birds. 5,000 species is roughly half of the known species in the world, and that was his goal. There's a, a record that he would be breaking at about 4,300 something species, so he wanted to go actually beyond that to 5,000. Long story short is he did it. He spanned seven continents, and he saw 6,042 species. So he went way over his goal of 5,000. He had a really successful year, lots of adventures, and he worked with local guides all around the world, local birders, actually. And um, yeah, he's a really nice guy. So he and I are actually gonna meet up today in Portland, and we're gonna be looking for a yellow-bellied sapsucker, which in Oregon is a rare bird. It's actually not one that we have regularly in the state. There's been a young uh, yellow-bellied sapsucker, a young bird hanging out at a particular park for the last couple months, so we're gonna go look for that bird, and then we're gonna chat about uh, Noah's book and what he's been up to, so it should be a pretty good day. It should be a good time. All right, let's go. Uh, Noah, thank you so much for being here today. This is really cool, You're a busy guy, so I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I have a few questions for you that I've been rolling around. Um, one is, you know, here we are in Oregon in a beautiful Oregon day, Oregon winter day, which I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm, Liquid not, sunshine, I'm serious, yeah, 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 it's not pouring rain, so we're happy about that, but, um, you know, your global big year, seeing all those birds, seeing all that diversity, really amazing birds, how has your perspective changed on birding in Oregon, in your home region, and on the birds here, it hasn't changed at all? Yeah, what was really cool was to spend this whole year birding around the world and seeing all these exotic birds that I'd never seen before, or practically ever heard of before in a lot of cases. And then coming back home, it was like coming back to see old friends, the chestnut back chickadees and stellar jays, and even the American crows and the robins, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was like birds that I know and um, have this history with instead of just meeting new birds all the time. Right. So awesome. I like both things. I like making a list of new birds that I've never seen before, but I also like getting to know the same bird repeatedly. I could sit and watch a crow all day long and try to figure yeah. out what it's doing. Yeah. No, I think that's really good. And that's one thing that you emphasized in your book is that what you did and what you do is not just about ticking off birds on a list and moving on right away, but about sticking around and learning something about the bird maybe and, and maybe you know, getting them to see behavior and things like that, which I really appreciate and I think that's really cool. So so you have said that the turkey vulture is maybe your favorite bird or one of your favorite birds. Is that still true? Yeah, I think these days I have co-favorite birds. So one of my favorite birds is the Adelie penguin, just because I spent a lot of time in yeah, Antarctica cool. studying them. In Happy Feet, they're the ones with the Mexican accents. I oh, think sh- they have the most charisma out of all the yeah. penguins. How big are they? They're pretty short. They're maybe yeah, knee guys. high. Okay, yeah. But then my other favorite bird is the turkey vulture, mm-hmm. and I have some history with turkey vultures in Oregon. <laughs> Weren't you something about you were putting carcasses out to draw them in or something? Get photographs? Yeah, or? so in David Attenborough's series Life of Birds, which is still my favorite TV show of all time, he goes out into this Trinidad rainforest with a piece of rotting beef, like an old steak, that. and he buries it under the leaf litter on the forest floor, and then he backs off, and lo and behold, like 45 minutes later, this turkey vulture comes out of nowhere, yeah. sails down through the canopy, and goes to that spot, and digs up the piece of meat, and when I saw that, I was a sophomore in high school, I think, and I was like, I've got to try this at home, that is just too cool, but I figured if Sir David could do it with a piece of steak, then maybe... I'd need a certain handicap, so I decided I'd go out and find a full-size roadkill deer carcass, drag that home, put it in the front yard, and see how many turkey vultures I could attract, and <laughs> so I, I did. A hot summer afternoon, I found a flattened doe by the side of Interstate 5, pulled over, put it in the trunk of my car single-handedly, drove home, put it in the front yard, much to my parents' chagrin, I think, <laughs> and uh, the next morning there were 25 turkey vultures really? sitting 25. on the roof of our house. They wow. cleaned the whole thing up in a week. Wow, that is fantastic. <laughs> so I have this appreciation for turkey vultures. That's I think they're super cool birds. Yeah. They have an amazing sense of smell. They're very elegant the way they fly. They're 
super secretive. I've only ever seen one turkey vulture nest in my entire life for how common they are. I think that's amazing. They have no vocalization. They have an incredible digestive system. That's so, yeah. respect for the No, that's vulture. cool. Respect, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, if you... I, I, I want to say when you do this again, but I, I, <laughs> I, as I understand, you're not planning on doing this again. If you were to, or if you were to give advice to someone who wants to do a global big year, what might you tell them to do differently than what you did? Of course, you know, they could just do exactly what you did, but like, what lessons did you learn? You'd be like, yeah, I'd probably do it differently. Well, strategically speaking, if you want to see more species of birds, uh, you can definitely fine-tune how many days I spend in certain countries and add some countries and subtract some countries here and there. On average, I guess I would probably even go faster if I were to do it again. Just because you pick up so many new birds the first day in a new area and then that starts to taper off really fast. Right. And you want to keep moving so you keep getting those hits. <laughs> so purely strategically, you can get more birds by tweaking things sure. here and there. Sure. Um, but also, enjoy the adventure along the way. You know, this right. is a life experience. It's not just a record. It's no. a lot more than just the numbers. So, you've been all around the world. You've seen all kinds of cool places that many of us just dream we could go to. If you were to go back to some of these places, like, is there anywhere that kind of is pulling at your heart? It's like, man, that place was so cool. Or, like, I'd really love to see more of the birds of that place. Like, you know... Where might you go back to if you have the opportunity? Absolutely. That's one of the more frustrating parts of doing a big year like this is you always have to keep moving and you feel rushed a lot of the time and you never have time to see everything there is to see in any given one spot before you have to move on. So now I kind of have to go back to all these places because <laughs> <laughs> I'm missing birds everywhere. I managed to miss 4,000 species during the course of that year. Um, if I had to pick, I'd say... Maybe Madagascar I'd really love to go back to. I only had a week there, yeah. and after, out of those seven days, I I only really had four good birding days because there was a airline strike happening and some other stuff while I was there. And I didn't even get to go to southern Madagascar where a lot of the cool birds are, and yeah. you know, not to mention all the lemurs and stuff. Right, like that. right. I mean, Madagascar is an amazing place. For you got to spend yeah. weeks there to really feel like you've seen most of it, anyway. Right. So you're a young guy, you've done this, you have, what is it, a, a very large list of species that you've seen already, you have a long life ahead of you, do you think that you have, or do you have any interest in trying to see a lot more of that diversity pushing towards all of the species? And I know, of course, the taxonomy is changing and will change, we're probably going to discover a lot of cryptic diversity, yeah. more species, it's going to be 18,000 someday, but let's say it doesn't, let's say it's, you know, somewhere between 10 and 11,000 or something like that. I mean, what do you think? 20 years? Could you get close to that or break the record? What's the record these days? There's a couple guys now, I think, who have seen more than 9,000 birds. Uh, there's about 10,500 total. I don't think anybody will ever see them all. Even the top listers now are still missing a 1,000 species, and they're really hard ones, you know, that may or may not be extinct kind of thing, or in war zones right. or that kind of thing. So I, I guess my goal has never been to life list every bird in the world. I'm more interested in pursuing specific projects and uh, learning in depth about some bird or going on an adventure with birds in some defined capacity rather than just trying to collect them all. Yeah, but yeah. I still do <laughs> like seeing new birds, so I'm yeah. sure I'll be continuing to travel yeah. as, as long as I'm able. Yeah. So your list will grow kind of incidentally as you yeah. have more adventures, <laughs> but yeah, like you had that big goal, you did it, so yeah, I, I totally hear you. That's like other sort of ways of, of approaching this whole natural world thing. Do you have, in the course of that year, did you really improve on any particular skills, like birding related or travel related, or even like maybe interpersonal related? Like, did you come out the other side on that year going, man, I really got better at X, Y, and Z? Oh yeah, I think uh, I became much more flexible as a traveler <laughs> and less apt to stress out about, you know, just delays and that kind of thing. Take that a lot more in stride now, which I think is good. Um, Birding-wise, I think I got a lot better at birding by ear because you're allowed to count bird-only birds, and I was counting them and keeping track of them separately. I think at the end, 331 species 
were bird only, so about 5% of the bad, total. Yeah. But I was constantly listening to bird sounds yeah. that I was unfamiliar with in all these different places where I haven't really traveled that much. And so I was with local birders who were helping point out different bird sounds and then we could try to track them down and confirm what they were. And that got me so fascinated in birding by ear, which I like anyway. Yeah. In, around here, I pretty much know all the bird sounds in Oregon. That one of the first things I did when I got back home was I bought myself a nice parabolic uh, reflector dish and a nice microphone. Cool. I've been going yeah. around and recording bird sounds on my Fantastic. own just for fun. Yeah. It's, a, it's a whole new world. I think this is my last question. So, you know, you, you talked about when you were in South Africa and you're on safari and you stop to look at Sisticola or something and then you have the, the traffic jam behind you of the 15 land cruisers and they're all wondering what you're looking at. And then you just be like, it's a bird, and they're like, and then they just drive off, right? So, you know, I've had the same experience myself. You have it walking around and birding almost anywhere. You know, oh, what you looking at? You know, oh, a bird. Uh, okay. You know, obviously not all the time. Um, you know, if you have, or do you have, like, an elevator pitch to, like, the non-birder or the person on the street to, to explain why birding is exciting or what, you know, what draws you to birding? Like, like what would you tell someone on the street about the attraction of I think that birds are inherently fascinating on their own, and people just don't realize that, and they don't pay attention, usually. They don't realize how many birds are around us. So if you can get someone just to look at a bird, in some situations anyway, they'll suddenly be like this light bulb goes off. And you're like, wow, that's super cool. I didn't even realize this bird lived here behind my house. You know, and put up a bird feeder or something, and all of a sudden you're communicating and watching nature right outside where you live, and it brings it into your sphere. And so I think that uh, people are separated from nature now in ways that we haven't been for most of human history, and just getting outside and getting reacquainted with it is satisfying in a lot of ways and I think people need that in today's digital culture <laughs> oftentimes and, and birding really helps. Birds are on their own colorful and loud and uh, they have beautiful songs mm -hmm. and they're easy to see, they're diurnal right. you know, during the daytime so when we're actually awake they're a good gateway drug yes. to caring about exactly. the rest of the environment and nature exactly, they're good, good ambassadors for the natural world, yeah that's a great Cool, man. Well, thank you. That, that, was, well, that sure. was fantastic. Yeah.